Good morning. It's good to have you today. What a joy to always gather together in the name of the Lord as we learn from his word, as we pay attention to what he says to us. So you're most welcome for today's service as we continue digging into the scriptures and seeing what the Holy Spirit is saying to us as a people. We continue into chapter 4. We already read four verses last week. We are going to be, we'll read until 14, verses 14 for today and the Lord will bless us all. Before that, let's ask for God's blessing as we read his word. Lord, we thank you. We bless your name, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of all grace. We come before you this morning asking that you uh, fill us with understanding as we read your word, and we pray that you be gracious to us, Lord, to uh, give us understanding of it, Lord. We, we want to uh, live in accordance to your word, and we cannot do that without you revealing your word to us. And so we pray as we read today, as we talk about it, that your Holy Spirit will be present to help us understand it. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. For the sake of context, we'll read from the first verse until 14. If you have the copy of God's word, let's read together. Now as they spoke to the people, the priests and the captains of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preach in the resurrection from the dead. In Jesus, the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands upon them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of men came to about five thousand and it came to pass on the next day that the rulers elders and scribes as well as Annas the high priest Caiaphas John and Alexander and as many as were of the family of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem and when they had set them in the midst they asked by what power or by what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means it's been, he's been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth whom you crucified whom God raised from the dead by him this man stands before you whole and this is the stone which was rejected by the builders which has become the chief cornerstone nor is there salvation in any other for there is no other name under heaven given amongst men by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, and they marveled, and they realized that they had been with Jesus. 
What we're going to talk about this morning is boldness in sharing Christ. Boldness in sharing Christ. We see this story spilled from chapter 3 where we saw the miracle of this man who was over 40 years. He's been there for quite a long time at the gate called Beautiful. And when he was excited for a moment that he's going to receive alms from these two men, this is what Peter said. Silver and gold I do not have, but what I have in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. One of the greatest miracles we see here. But also we see that after this miracle happened, many people were drawn to that assembly. They gathered together to come see who these people were, they probably already knew them, but they gathered together because this was a notable miracle that happened that day. And after that, what happened is Peter did not now focus on the man who was healed, he focused on preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. The man was healed, we thank God for that. But now there is something that is important for the rest of the people. Their lives are at danger of going to hell if they do not receive Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter where they were. All of them were found in the temple, but not all of them were born again. The Bible says here, as he spoke, as they continued speaking the truth to these people, the priest And the captains of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them. That means they sent soldiers to go and get them, to arrest them. Being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. This was the genesis. This was the main problem why they are arresting these two gentlemen because they preached in the name of Jesus the resurrection of the dead. And they lay hands on them and put them in custody until the next day for it was already evening. However, many of those who of those who heard the word, believed. And the number of the men came to about 5,000 people. Now look at the agitation of this man. These are the most powerful men in the land right now. And they are greatly offended because Peter and John are preaching in the name of Jesus and they are preaching about the resurrection of the dead. You wonder why they didn't go and arrest many of them when the Holy Spirit came upon them and they preached and many people gave their lives to Jesus Christ. You know, after um, the apostle preached the gospel so hard, He told them that it is you that took him to the cross. And the congregation, the people, they said, what must we do? Considering that this message really is for us. Peter told them to repent and be baptized. And now after that, he's been regularly, or they have been regularly going to worship, going for prayer times in the temple, and they were never arrested. You wonder what these people were thinking, the religious leaders. Were they still planning to arrest them at the end of the day? What was their motives when they would see this man walk into the temple? Or... Perhaps they, you know, their seats are over there and the rest of the people are over here. So perhaps they don't even see them. But the rest of the guards probably are aware that they come for worship. And they get these people in custody until the next day. Why? Because they were not allowed 
to pass any judgment in the evening time. So they put them in custody as they await for judgment and the verdict tomorrow. And I'm just thinking what is going through their minds because before, these are the same group of people who were present when Jesus was taken before them to be judged by them, to be questioned by them, because these high priests were there, these temple gods were there, these Pharisees were there, and the Sadducees, all of these people were present. And perhaps they have been reminded that this is the same Peter who denied Jesus three times. And all they're thinking, maybe if we give him time, he will not boldly speak about Jesus tomorrow. Maybe he will water down things a little bit. To be politically correct, that is what people do. If you've heard politicians talk, today they will stand and say a lot of words. And tomorrow when they are asked, they say, no, that is not what we meant. That is not what I meant, right? They do that all the time because they want to be politically correct. They want to be accepted with people at all times. And of course, we know what they mean. We know what they said. But because they are men in power, there's nothing you can do as a layman, as a laywoman. There's nothing you can do. Perhaps these are the things that are going through their minds. Maybe they'll be politically correct and water down a little bit. Maybe they will begin saying a few words, you know, not, not talking really hard about Jesus, just mentioning a few words here and there, not talking about uh, the resurrection from the dead, but still preaching the gospel, not talking about the blood of Jesus, but still mentioning the name of Jesus as many people would do today. We want to be politically correct. This kind of boldness that we see in this man comes when we have conviction from the inside out about our relationship with Jesus Christ. Those people who have no conviction, they cannot have this kind of boldness. How do you speak in front of the religious leaders and the most powerful people in the land in this manner? They did not expect it at all. But nonetheless, they spoke. The Bible tells us that being greatly disturbed, that they taught the people and preached in the name, preached Jesus and preached the resurrection, that Jesus rose from the dead. This was a troubling sentiment. The Sadducees, who were the most learned people when it comes to the law, they knew about the resurrection from the dead, but they did not want to take it in that Jesus died and rose again, and that through him all these things are bound to happen. You remember when Jesus Christ rose again, these were the people who paid the gods To shut up. And that when people would ask the gods, you know, where is Jesus? That they would say the disciples came and took him away. So if they are able to do that, if they are able to bribe the gods so that this information is taken away from the people, what else do you think these people are able to do? They are able to kill people. They are able to lock you down for the rest of your life so that you don't speak. 
as we preach, brothers and sisters, Christ's resurrection must be the central message. Preach about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because if he did resurrect, where would you think the church would be? I mean, many people came and taught and died. So what would be our reference point if he didn't resurrect? This is the power of the gospel, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And this is what they're trying to refute. But nonetheless, they get these two gentlemen in custody, but the rest of the people who heard the gospel, what happened? They got born again. That means your labor in the Lord will never go in vain. Sometimes we don't look at it that way. But your labor in the Lord does not go in vain. We all have opportunities to boldly and faithfully deliver God's word in truth to people. Because God has given us the opportunity to do so. Regardless of where we are. At home with our children. Where you teach at a school. Where you work in your office. In your business. We all have opportunities to preach Jesus. We all have. But sometimes we think... This is a responsibility delegated to those few men and women who are on the stage up here. This is our collective responsibility to preach Jesus Christ. Those who heard you speak Jesus will gladly receive him. But not all of them. When you preach to people, you will have skeptics. You will have people who will tell you that they've read the Bible from page to page and there's nothing you can tell them. You'll have a lot of people who know a few things about one subject and they would want to use it against you when you're preaching to them. But remember, when we are going out to preach to people, we want to get to their hearts, not to their heads. Because our heads are clogged with a lot of things. We want people's hearts to be changed so that they can refocus and think straight. They were taken in and it came to pass on the next day that the rulers and elders and scribes as well as Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the family of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. This was the gathering of the mighty, we would say. This was a devolution conference. <laughs> the powerful men of the land are present. And do you know if these people are present, what happens to the citizens? They don't care whether you're driving on the road, you'll be kicked off. Because the most important people have come. Remember, it's your vote that kept them in there or gave them the power to be where they are. But when they are coming for their own meetings, you are as nothing. You think they care about you. Did you guys saw the amount of vehicles that were present in this town? That was a lot of money. <laughs> that was a lot of your money. Did you know that? <laughs> that is a lot of the taxpayers' money. They buy things tax-free. They drive, drive vehicles, they don't pay for fuel. Many of their things are tax-free, tax-free. And who is paying the tax? You and I. Yet, they're like, Buana mkubwa. Buana mkubwa vindushina. 
We, 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 we sing their names when they come around town. They, that is my guy. That is my guy. He doesn't even know who you are. Please, know Jesus. Leave these people alone. <laughs> you know Jesus? He knows you by name, by the way. The number of hairs in your head, he has the number. They are brought before the most powerful man in the land. And that, this, for a moment, will scare you. Honestly, this will scare you. You are before the high priest. In fact, it's, whatever he was teaching was a bit scary to these people, especially um, Annas, who is the high priest, and they are preaching, and they are insinuating that Jesus is the high priest. <laughs> you, you think he's just going to take this information lightly? There's another high priest that is not me. There's another governor that is not me. Where is he? They didn't take this matter lightly. They brought them before this assembly in the midst. And this is what they asked. By what power or by what name have you done this? Listen, church. This for me is a no-brainer kind of a question. <laughs> they already know what happened. That is why they are troubled. Why do you think they are asking again? Because listen, from the beginning of time, this is what the enemy has always done to put doubt in God's word on, in our hearts so that we will not speak the truth. You remember in the Garden of Eden, saying what? Did God really say? <laughs> Did God really say? Be careful of the enemy's language. Did God say you shouldn't touch it? You shouldn't eat of it? God is trying to hide things from you. Or by whose name, by whose authority are you doing this? It is just the same, same language phrased differently from the same, same author of all liars. He wants to put doubt in your heart. Saying to you that, you, you're sick. This God doesn't care about you. If he did, he could have healed you. If he did, he could have given you a job. You're jobless for a long time. If he did, he could have given you already a husband and a wife and a good house and a good vehicle. All these things. The enemy is just trying to whisper things in your head so that you will yield and when we think about these things, they seem logical, right? Very logical. And sometimes we are in the middle of these things going through them. What are you going to do? Be careful of the enemy's language. Did God really say, or by whose name and authority are you doing this? Listen. The enemies, he knows the answer, but he wants you to say something different. He wants you to say something different. Something that will compromise your walk with Jesus Christ. So that when you ask question, you say, Ata squangi serious na imambo ya God. Squangi serious. And when you go that direction, trust me, they will even give you a post in the government. <laughs> they will give you responsibilities in their own office of power because they know you won't say no more. You won't preach no more in the name of Jesus, the resurrection from the dead. They already have you. So be watchful and be careful. 
religious leaders, and many others were grieved that the gospel was preached publicly and boldly. And these are the two aspects that we need to get in our system as a people. That we need to do it publicly and boldly. And these are the two aspects that the, all the governments of the world right now are fighting against. They don't want us to read the word of God publicly. They don't want us to preach boldly. If you mention anything that is against what they believe, they take you down. You're against LGBTQ, they take you down. Why? Because you're offending them. You're offending the religious leaders and the most powerful men. Whatever subject it is. People who don't understand basic biology to differentiate from, you know, a man from a woman. <laughs> basic biology that children knows. The way God crafted us. Do you know there is one specific bone in our bodies that distinguish male and female? Do you know that? Did you know that? It's in your biology class. <laughs> These people, they don't know it, or they are afraid to face the truth. The logical things are no more logical to them. A question that is very simple, like, by what power? <laughs> by what name have you done this? In other words, if you really wanted to upset them the more, you'd ask them a question again like a Kenyan. You know, Kenyan, someone will ask us a question, we ask them a question back, right? We then respond straight. How about this? What, what happened with this? Well, now, Naji. <laughs> we, we don't respond. Man, it's funny. I saw that, that's why I asked. Unatembea? No, nalala. By what power? I would have said to them, what do you think? Or what have they told you? <laughs> so that I can help you understand. What did they say to you? Seems very logical, but that is not what they did. That is not what the apostles did. Whenever you're asked a question about Christ or about what you believe, your response should be very direct and clear. They want to talk about Jesus? Fine, open the page. Talk about Jesus. They want to talk about baptism? Fine. Talk about baptism. Talk about salvation. Whatever subject it is, don't meander, meander. Don't go kando ya musitu. Go straight into the forest and harvest the trees in there. Tell them what it is. Explain to them what they need to hear. And you know, if you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, you will meander around. You will go just beside trying to get things, trying to bring things that don't make sense. Go straight and explain to them the gospel. You see what happened? The Bible says here, then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, say to them, rulers of the people and elders of Israel, This is how you respond to them. And you only do this when you are filled with the Holy Spirit because when you're not filled, your response will be of the flesh and you you try to please them. Instead of speaking the truth, you begin to say words will be 
pleasing to their ears. If we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he's been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. Speaking about very important things. Defending the cause of Jesus Christ. If you forget about him, by the way, he's the Jesus you knew, the Jesus of Nazareth. He's the same one we are talking about. Maybe there's another Jesus somewhere else. This is the Jesus of Nazareth I am talking to you about. So this is to jog their brain a little bit, to bring it to memory. It is Jesus Christ of Nazareth whom you crucified. So instead of appeasing them, he's going ahead and igniting the fire. <laughs> because they totally don't want this subject of people dying and coming back to life again. He said, hey, remember, it is you who crucified them. Him. They know that for sure. Right? And number two, he said to them, whom God raised from the dead. He's now speaking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That though you crucified him, Though we saw him dead at the cross, he's no longer in the grave, he's alive. And this is the power of the gospel, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And this is what got the Sadducees mad again. How dare you preach the resurrection of Jesus Christ? This man did not resurrect. You're allowed to say other things that he taught. You're allowed to call him rabbi. You can do other things, but don't teach about the resurrection from the dead. Whom God raised from the dead. That is the second thing he's mentioning. And thirdly, he's telling them the evidence of what this resurrected Jesus did is right in front of you. There is the evidence of the miracle. He said, by him, this man stands here before you whole. He stands before you whole. Can you deny that? Probably not. Why? Because this man was of age. Over 40 years old, everyone has seen him in the gate, in the entrance of the gate called Beautiful. And it's undeniable. And as we mentioned last week also, that the miracles that God does, they are undeniable and they can be traced. These are the ones that we are struggling to trace where, when they happen and how they happen and people will just always say, oh, we, we did this and they, we took him to the doctor and the doctor said, there's no more cancer, there's no more fibroid, there's no more this. And no one can verify that it actually did happen. Be aware that there are a lot of counterfeit things happening in the world. Listen, the things that are happening in the spiritual world, they are real as it can be. You remember when Moses was sent to Pharaoh, throw down his stick, and all these other mag magicians, they also did the same, and the snakes appeared. <laughs> these things, 
telling you, they're real. The Bible makes it clear for us that we are fighting not against flesh and blood, but things that are of the spiritual world. They are present. Though we don't see them with our physical eyes, these things, they do happen. And this war that these men are trying to fight, this is beyond physical. Because in the physical realm, they cannot even dispute it. This physical miracle, it awakened the spiritual aspect that we need to embrace, that is dealing with the heart of man. That was the end, of resu- the end result of this um, miracle. This man stands here before you. In other words, look at this man. Can you dispute it? And because they knew that it was real, and perhaps they have gone through that place many times, they have seen the man, and probably they were guilty because they didn't help the man. They have seen him more than enough time. They were not able to help him. But see what is happening. Help has come from heaven, and they want to wish it away. And he's saying to them, this is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. (laughs) The stone that was rejected. Who are the builders? Look at the language here. He's calling them the builders. And they have rejected the chief cornerstone. Their responsibility, if they were in their right mind, was to teach people God's word so that all the people's lives would be founded upon God, that God would be the foundation of every soul that breathed upon the earth. But then they did not do their job. They were the teachers of the law, but they never taught people the law of God. And instead, they heaped upon people laws upon laws upon laws, things that they themselves are not able to do, but they heaped them upon the people. Just reaping of the benefits of what people are doing. He said, this is the stone which was rejected by you. He's speaking right to their hearts, like poking them every time. You crucified him. And this stone that is supposed to be the chief cornerstone, you people rejected him. But he's become the chief cornerstone. He's become the pillar of the church. That you guys had the opportunity to preach the gospel, you refused it. God has given other people this responsibility and Jesus will be preached no matter what. He will be preached. And especially with the people who they are calling unschooled. They are unlearned. Correctly, if you translate it from the Greek, it says they were idiots. (laughs) They knew nothing about the law. Nothing about biology, nothing about physics and mathematics, none of that. They were very unschooled people. Yet this same Jesus that you refused, he's become the chief cornerstone. So therefore, there is no, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is 
no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. <laughs> I love this confidence and boldness. He's telling them that though you might know a lot of things, though might, you might be schooled, but let me tell you, under the heavens, there is no other name by which we must be saved except the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. There's no other name. They wanted to know by whose name this happened. They are getting full dose of his name and what they must do. They must be born again through the name of Jesus Christ. Now they saw, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. This sentiment will mark the end of our subject today. That for any great thing to happen in our lives, we must be present with Jesus. The question would be, when people look at my life, they look at your life, are they able to see Jesus in you? Because they saw it in this man. Not just physically, but this kind of boldness. I want to imagine that the rest of their lifetime, they never encountered such bold men in their lives who would come before them and say, hey, you guys are a bunch of sinners that need to be born again. You guys think you know the law, but you're going to perish in your sins. Perhaps they got a hint of it, a bit of it, from John the Baptist, who called them the brood of vipers. People who are just bringing forth vipers. <laughs> Venoms coming out of their lives. You brood of vipers. You haven't repented. This was very noted that when they looked at them they knew that they have been with Jesus as I've said earlier we all have opportunities to present Christ to people We all have. The question is, are you equipped to present Jesus to the world? Are you equipped? Do you read God's word? Do you pray? It is estimated that in the uh, free countries, where people can freely talk about God and Jesus. It is estimated that in people have at least two Bibles or more in their houses, in their homes, and perhaps your homes. But they barely read their Bibles. Barely. You have a lot of them, you don't read your Bible. Yet in the countries where it is illegal 
people have crammed the Bible. They have it at heart. And they wonder why we are not powerful, yet we have the freedom to read God's word publicly. We can boldly preach his word, yet not much is happening. It was noticed that these men have been with Jesus. Though they appeared unschooled, they schooled the learned men. They taught them a lesson. If they wanted history, biblical history, oh man, these men were prepared for that. They, it's ironic that they taught people about the Messiah, but when he showed up, he was their enemy. God become, becomes their enemy when they were waiting to see him. Peter's response was aimed at convicting them of their sins, not actually condemning them but convicting them of their sins. And that was the sin of unbelief and arrogance. They're like, hmm, these unschooled people, what do they know? <laughs> and we have, re we have read it from the Bible. The Bible says that God uses the foolish things to confound the wise of this world. So their, all their wisdom, all the things they've always known, imagine they were confounded just in a few minutes. These unschooled men. And sometimes people will say, oh, you know, this thing of preaching, of preaching, it belongs to pastors. <laughs> this is not our call. I cannot come to your house and read the Bible for you every day. That is your own responsibility. You want to grow in the law, you must. It is not a suggestion. It's a command that we read his word. You can't be a double-minded person and receive anything from God. The Bishop James says so. Any double-minded person cannot receive anything of the Lord at all. You're in the world a little bit, you're in the church a little bit, you're trying to do things here and there. You're like, man, God, God will understand. That is what people say. God will understand. I mean, I was caught up in the flesh and what, what could I have done? God will understand. I mean, you saw that person. You saw that lady. She was pretty. What could I have done? Silly men encouraging themselves in their sins. <laughs> no, there's many things you can do. Do you know one thing you can do? You can run away. Joseph in the Bible, what did he do? He ran away. He was accused. He went through a lot of heartaches and a lot of trouble in there. But his labor in the Lord was not in vain. It paid off. Have you guys studied the history of these pyramids in Egypt? People are trying to change the history of these things. But did you know that these pyramids were built during the time of Joseph? And they exist until today. 
Do you know the amount of storage place that one pyramid would hold? This was storage for food for how many years? Seven years. And they exist until today. People are trying to rewrite the story. Oh, there are these people, these people built it. None of that. It was built in the times of Joseph. And God, through his own wisdom, gave those people wisdom to build it in such a way that they would save their grains in there and it would not go bad for years. The genius of God cannot be compared. He gives people knowledge for preservation. Yet, people still say, oh, this God of yours, if you're worshiping this God, why is this happening to you? Why is this happening? Why is this? If you're walking with the Lord, it will be noticed that you have been with the Lord. Peter's response was aimed at convicting them that this is, there's only one name the name Jesus. There's only one person who can save your lives. That is the man Jesus Christ. You accept him, he will save you. You will have a new life. You will have a new walk. What profit is the man if you gain the whole world, if you gain all the power and then lose your soul? Did you realize also that the things that the enemy wants to give to us, they're very temporal, and they're things that will be destroyed at the end of the time? You remember in the, in the desert with Jesus, he says, if you worship me, I'll give you all the world. <laughs> and the Bible tells us that the world and everything that is in it will perish. In fact, it will melt like wax. <laughs> so why do you want to give me something that is temporal? Because he knows we love those things that are temporal. We love those things that we'll, we'll see and enjoy. We'll enjoy them, but just for a short time. This gospel was preached to this man. And they noticed that they were very uneducated. They were never trained because they were mere fishermen. They were mere Galileans. They were already profiled even before they came before them. <laughs> you know how we do that? We, we size people, right? We look people up, down, up, down. This one can buy at a thousand. Up, down, this one is for 50 bob. <laughs> we size people. We categorize people. These people, they can, you know, they're not able to do this. So the same product. As I bring the worship team to come, I want you to think with these religious leaders and the elders and all the Sadducees, what is going through their minds right now? That they brought people to judge them and they were pretty much convicted that these people are gonna go in real quick. They have nothing to say. If we say this, this is, they're gonna, they, they, they'll, they'll be afraid to defend themselves. And now next week we'll, say, we'll see how this is going to turn out. But think about it. They're already troubled in their hearts. They're thinking, how is it possible that we want to put these people in jail, yet whatever they have done, 
is noticeable and is not of them is of God. How do we deal with this situation? How are we going to go about it? Or if it was you, you are the believer. You are the one in custody. What response would you have given to them? Would you defend the cause of the gospel? Would you water things down so that you're politically correct with these people? So that you're not in trouble? Because every one of us, we do not like trouble, right? We don't like trouble. We don't, we, some of us, if we see police and we haven't done anything wrong, in fact, they can just arrest you for being fearful. <laughs> You're so afraid. They see you and they know, ah, ndio yule muoga. Tisha ye kidogo watatoa kitu. And they know. Yesterday we were traveling from Nakuru and they, they stopped us. We are four of us in a small vehicle. A small vehicle is supposed to carry five maximum, right? And they have other two people out there and they say, hey, saidia wa maofisa mwapeleke. I asked them, how many are they? They say two. I said, no, we cannot carry two. The capacity of this vehicle is five. And it's like, kama inge kuwa family yako, si unge beba wenge. I say, no, we only carry five. That is what is required of the law. And he got, you would look at his face, he got tired with me for doing what is right. You know what he was telling me? That, you, you know, if anyone asks you, tell them that we have allowed you. Really? Th that is how the enemy works in people's life. No, go tell them that the governor has said, you know, there will be no problem. You go, go ahead. Go ahead and do that. Go ahead and sin. Go ahead and do all these things. Go ahead and compromise on your faith. It is so sad that the people who are trying to do what is right are the people who are going to be hit hard, right? Even when it comes to these, you know, negotiations, I've seen it, we were from one yesterday. <laughs> the people who want to do right are the people who are going to be beaten so by. But what when Jiyam Kato? They just continue with their lives, no problem. But I want to encourage us as a church. Do what is right, no matter what it takes. Preach the gospel, whether they're going to put it, you in jail. Say, Lord, I'm here. <laughs> Voila. I preach in your name, I'm here. If I should die for the cause of the gospel, I would count it all joy. There's nothing much I can do than just to stand firm and do what my Lord has called me to do. Every one of us in this room, stand firm in your office, at your workplace. These corrupt things, we talk about corruption every time it begins with us. We give them the power to continue being corrupt because we are corrupt. If they say stuff and you say no, that is, would be the genesis of taking this thing from the root. Let us not compromise. Let us have boldness as we are sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. He rewards those who are diligent. 
That is why the Apostle Paul would say that I have fought a good fight of faith. A good fight of faith. It was always a battle. We know he was stoned many times. After he's out of the stones, his body is deformed. He goes to the next town and preaches the gospel. What a man. And you'd look at the apostles and you'd say, they have been with Jesus. I wonder what people say about us today. All they can say, they have been with themselves because they're full of themselves. I pray that as a church, the world around us will look at us and say, they are with Jesus. They are walking with Jesus. They are with Jesus. That alone will speak to many people who are around us. Ironically, that those who are not born again, they know how we ought to live. <laughs> they know how we ought to conduct ourselves. If you do something fishy and silly, they say, Allah, <laughs> they know. They're just rebellious. They don't want to follow Jesus Christ. But thank God for all of us who are here. We are not rebellious. We are obeying the voice of God. Let his name be known greatly out there because of how we live our lives. Amen? Let us pray together. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you that you are good at all times. We thank you that you give to us opportunities every day and every week to share your word. Whether it's our own children, whether it's our own husbands and wives, whether it's our own siblings, our own colleagues at work, our business counterparts, Whatever place we, we are, we have an opportunity to share you with people. How I pray that you will give us such a rich boldness for us not to relent, that when we are called upon to defend the cause of the gospel, we will do it truthfully and faithfully. So help us, God. In in ourselves, we know we have no power to do so apart from what we have received from you. When we are filled with your spirit, we'll do mighty things. Mighty things. So I pray that you help us to abide in you, to remain in you, so that we'll be fruitful in our world today. And as we give to you this morning, we pray that, oh God, you bless the works of our hands. And this is also a response, a response to us after you have blessed us abundantly at our workplaces, in our businesses. And we are saying, God, thank you. Thank you for these finances. As we give to you, we pray that our lives will be blessed. In Jesus' name, we pray, amen.